What's good, y'all? Welcome back. It's Jeff. In this video playlist, we're going to be working through example two of the linear algebraic nodal analysis algorithm. The example that you see here on screen focuses on a circuit with eight resistors, two voltage sources, and two current sources. Before we dive into this circuit and then build it using our actual laboratory equipment, I want to give a shout out real quick. This circuit material, including the write-up and others, will be available on my website, support website for this project, which is AppliedLinearAlgebra.com. If you search in DuckDuckGo or Google, uh, this is me right here, www.AppliedLinearAlgebra.com. At some point, I'll have a very, very nice um, description of a kind of a high level approach to this problem right here in the circuit analysis. But for now, if you go over to the blog on the top of that menu and then go down into linear algebra lab exercises right under teaching support, this project I call the Electrify the Linear System Problem for our students since it's designed to help students understand how linear algebra shows up in the real world, so to speak. On this website, I host a number of resources, the Linear Algebraic Nodal Analysis Example 2 circuit, all the research and development and support documents that you could ever want, I will be posting right here in this table under Example 2. At some point in the near future, I hope to have something like four or five of these different examples that highlight different aspects of this algorithm so that those who want to get a full idea of how this works can find that. However, for now, that will allow you to find resources relevant to this example. We're going to start by building this circuit. This is a complex circuit relative to what most students would see in their introductory coursework in circuit analysis. I specifically made these examples complex to highlight some of the benefits of working with matrices and vectors rather than working with scalars. We're going to start the process of building a real circuit governed by this ideal circuit schematic by focusing on both the wiring diagrams and the build instructions. In this case, we're going to start with a half-size breadboard, which we've seen before. We need two red jumper wires and two blue jumper wires. We're also going to grab a set of eight resistors. I have more than eight there, which is plenty for this particular purpose. I also need two DC current uh, voltage sources and then also two DC current sources. Assuming that I have all of that material, as well as four fully charged 9-volt batteries, which I'll grab in just a second, we're going to start our build, which is going to look like the circuit that you see on screen here. So my circuit is now fully connected. The next thing we're going to do is test that circuit. In order to test the circuit, remember we have to define the reference direction for both the current and the voltages. I've done that in my document, so let's switch over to that now. In order to define the reference directions, we start with our original schematic. We know that we have a few rules. Number one, the voltage drop references for each voltage source should have the same polarity as the actual attachments of those voltage sources. The current passing through the current sources should have the same reference direction as the actual connectivity of each current source. And then for every voltage drop and current reference direction, we should always say that the positive to negative drop reference is defines the arrow for the current. The other thing that we said was that in order to identify the individual nodes of the circuits, we're going to erase each element body. In this case, when we erase each element body, we see that there are actually seven nodes. Those are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So when we impose all of those circuit variables and label all the reference directions, we get something that looks like this. Now each of these, resistor 1, the voltage drop across resistor 1 goes from positive to negative. It has a current going this way. Same thing over here. These are done arbitrarily. The uh, current running through voltage source 1 goes from positive to negative. 
So from that perspective, we have now labeled every single variable that we can measure and model in this circuit. The next thing that we'll do is impose a directed graph model that encodes the individual current reference direction. When we do this, we're going to count for each element of our circuit, we assign one edge. So for resistor one, we say that that's edge one. For resistor two, we say that that edge two. And notice that the direction of each edge, each directed edge, is in the same direction as the current reference for that element. We continue going all the way through the resistor. So the first eight elements, the first eight resistors, correspond to the first eight edges. The moment we've exhausted all of our resistors, we move on to voltage sources. So we have eight resistors. We're going to move on to the next voltage source, which connects two to seven. We'll go ahead and label that number nine, because eight plus one is nine. When we go over to our next voltage source, we'll label that number 10. Now we've exhausted all the resistors and the voltage sources, the next thing to do is the current sources. We start with current source one. Current source one goes from four to two. We'll call that edge 11 because 10 plus one is 11. And then finally, the last current source goes from seven to five, which is exactly what we see here. This directed graph completely encodes the topology, the connectivity, and the corresponding reference directions, which we'll see is really, really important as we get into the analysis of our algorithm. For now, the reason that that's really important is we now have a concrete idea of every node and every di reference direction in the entire circuit. We can now use this information to measure the fundamental node variables from which all other circuit variables can be calculated. Let's do that. Here we see in table one, we're going to measure all seven node voltage potentials associated with the seven nodes in this circuit. In order to do that, the circuit diagram is say we're going to ground node seven, which means we're going to take our negative lead of our multimeter, attach it to node seven, and not move it. We see on screen here that node seven is going to be the bottom node, the one to which the negative lead of my first voltage source is connected. So anywhere along that uh, set of leads is node 7. Node 1 is here, node 2, node 3, node 4, node 5, node 6, node 7. We're going to then use our red lead to just move along to each individual node, capture the measurements along that, and then just put it in the measured value there. Let's go ahead and switch over to our actual real circuit to capture those measurements and fill out that table. Here we go. We're going to make these measurements. So I attach my negative lead anywhere in node 7. That includes the bottom wires here. And then I'm going to go ahead and move my positive lead around up top. So let's go to node 1 first. Node 1 looks like 2.486 volts. So I'm going to go ahead and capture that as 2.486 volts. We move our positive lead over to node 2. Let's capture that. It looks like 4.97 volts. 4.97 volts is the measurement. Okay, now we're going to move on to node 3, which is in between the resistor 4 and resistor 7. Here we see that that is approximately 3.740. We'll go on to node 4, which is going to be on the other side of resistor 7, based on the original schematic, which it looks like 4.9. 8 volts is what we get from the measurement that we take. And then uh, we're going to go on to node, uh, I think this is node 5, which looks like, uh, wow, it's in millivolts. So millivolts would be, um, it looks like 0 0.013 volts. So that's really, really close to 0 from the standpoint of these other measurements. Um, and then we're going to go on to node 6, which is right in between. Node 6 looks like it's measuring 1.253, let's call it, volts. And then finally, we're going to go on to node 7, which indeed is 0 volts. That makes a lot of sense since uh, node 7 is the node that we attach ground to, and there should be no voltage drop from that piece of metal to that piece of metal. 
We've now completely finished our measurement process. The claim that we're going to make is that this set of node potentials actually de completely determines the entire electronic behavior of that circuit. Another way to say that is all of these variables, it looks like I have 12 circuit elements times two circuit variables per element is 24 variables plus seven node variables. The moment that I have these, the claim is that I have all of those. And what we're going to see in the linear algebraic nodal analysis algorithm is that this matrix actually encapsulates everything that I need to know in order to model these nodes. In this case, we're going to target the first node, the one highlighted in blue, to model. We're also going to target the third node which is the one highlighted in kind of a salmon or a pink color. So that's this one. We're also going to target node 4, which is the one highlighted in yellow. This is node 4. And finally, we're going to target node 6, which is the one highlighted in that nice kind of violet color here. We're going to make a claim in the linear algebraic nodal analysis algorithm that this matrix is non-singular. This, this matrix is the same matrix that would arise if I ran classical nodal analysis on this. The major difference is we're going to show how to create this matrix structure using block matrices and relate it back to a bunch of really powerful theorems in linear algebra. In other words, we're going to filter all of circuit theory through linear algebraic structures rather than through scalar structures, which is what's done in traditional nodal analysis. When we go solve this matrix equation, let's go ahead and do that. I have written a MATLAB script to do this. You could also do it in a TI calculator. Um, I will provide the script free of charge on that uh, website so that you all have access to this if you want it. But let's go ahead and run this thing. So let's run this piece of code. Check that out. These node potentials I can store. This is U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. I've now transcribed those right here. So the ma matrix model that I'm using in my linear systems problem tells me that the node potential at, at node 1 should be 2.485. The node potential at no U2 should be 4.97. U3, I'm going to round to the third decimal digit because that's the accuracy of my measurement tool. Uh, and I just move down. We don't get a value for U7. And that is because U7 is defined to be the ground node. So in our model, we actually just ground that out. We'll get in a lot more of that as we work through this. But the point of the matter, though, is check that out. The actual physical measurements that I get from my circuit align quite nicely with the solution of this linear systems problem, which means instead of having to physically build my circuit, go through all the painstaking process of making all those measurements, et cetera, et cetera, I can deal with a matrix that looks like this. And then solving that matrix gives me this set of solutions. That is a really, really powerful thing for electrical engineers because it replaces physical build problems with mathematics problems. And the nice thing about that is, let's say that I wanted to change, hey, instead of having a 5 volt source here, I want to have a 10 volt source. What would happen if I redesigned the circuit with a 10 volt source? Well, in, in the build scenario, an electrical engineer would have to replace that circuit element with a 10 volt and then reanalyze all those. But in the case that I have a mathematical algorithm that runs on a computer, all I have to do is go to the second source and change this to 10 volts, rerun the darn thing, and my algorithm will spit out the new values of each of the node potentials. From that, I can get a classification of the voltage drops across each element and the current running through each element. And then from that, I can completely describe the entire behavior of the circuit, which means that I've translated analysis of circuit from physical measurements and pen and paper into computer algorithms. That is super powerful, and it's one of the themes or motif of applied mathematical modeling. Turn real world problems into stuff that we can run on a computer, understand what's happening in the background, and then I can iterate way faster than I can do by hand. In the next set of videos for this playlist, we're going to see exactly what I mean by this, by building this model and showing where this matrix arise from that given circuit. I'll see you in the next videos.